On July 29, 1967, on the flight deck of the supercarrier USS Forrestal, a rocket from an A-4 Phantom misfired, smashing into a Skyhawk opposite and starting a fire that led to huge explosions, threatening all 5,000 crew on board. This is the story of the fire on the USS Forrestal and of the crew that fought it. The Forrestal arrived off the coast of Vietnam on July 25, 1967. The 60,000 ton carrier under the command of Captain John Belling was usually assigned to the US Navy's Atlantic Fleet, but had been dispatched to Indochina to support Pacific Fleet carriers in meeting demands for increased bombing over Vietnam. As US troops poured in and the fighting intensified there, more than 122,000 attack sorties would be flown over Indochina that year, and the pace of operations was relentless. Over the first four days of Forrestal's deployment, dozens of combat sorties were carried out. Flight deck crews worked long shifts in high temperatures, with intense operational pressure to get aircraft turned around as quickly as possible. The fifth day of Forrestal's operations was scheduled to be no different, with a massive strike against a key railway line north of Hanoi planned for the late morning. Before that could happen though, Forrestal needed to take on more munitions, as its stocks were rapidly depleted by the intense pace of operations. On July 28th, the ammunition ship Diamond Head came alongside and transferred stocks of large 1,000 pound bombs to the carrier. But no sooner had these bombs come on board, Forrestal's ordnance personnel were concerned. These were not like other bombs of similar size they had been using. They were much older, of Second World War vintage, and appeared to be significantly degraded from years spent exposed to the elements in a depot somewhere. Worse still, they contained Composition B explosive, which became more unstable and more potent as it aged. Captain Belling was not happy, and complained to the Diamond Head, but was told that was all they had. The truth was, by mid-1967, the US military was running very low on bombs. Its stockpiles drained by Vietnam operations, and depots everywhere were down to the very bottom of the barrel. So there was no choice but to press on. The first wave of strikes on July 29th were successfully launched at 7am. These aircraft all returned successfully by 9.14, and preparations then began for the second strike of the day. This operation was the big one, with a strike element of A4 Skyhawks and A6 Intruders, equipped with 16 1,000 pound bombs and a variety of smaller ordnance. These would be supported by F4 Phantoms equipped with air-to-air -air missiles and ground attack rockets for suppressing anti-air positions. Every aircraft on the carrier had a unique three-digit identifier, which is what we'll be using to refer to them from here on. With the aircraft lined up on the flight deck, the pilots were summoned at 10.25, and the deck crew began the process of starting the aircraft up, strapping their pilots in, and carrying out pre-flight checks. A key concern for the crew at this stage was making sure the launches happened as quickly and as seamlessly as possible. Getting all of the strike aircraft over a target at the same time meant minimising the amount of time that the first aircraft to launch spent burning fuel waiting for the others to join it. To help speed things up, officers on Forrestal had earlier approved the change to procedure on board. To allow ground crew to connect the firing systems for the Zuni rocket pods on the Phantoms whilst they were still parked up, and not immediately prior to launching as had previously been done. This sped up takeoffs while still having the safeguard of the weapon's safety pins, which prevented the rocket pods from firing even with their connectors plugged in and would still only just be removed before takeoff. But unknown to these ship's senior officers, over the four days of intense operations, the safety pins had also not been making it to the catapult intact, due sometimes to high winds ripping them out, or sometimes to crewmen taking them out to save time. These factors meant that when at 10.50 Lieutenant Commander James Bangert climbed up into Phantom 110, he was getting into an aircraft that had its Zuni rocket system fully armed. Having strapped in and with the engine started by an external generator, Bangert then flicked a switch to shift his aircraft from relying on the external power to its own internal power. As he did so, for a split second there was a power surge, sending rogue currents throughout the Phantom, 
one of which ran down the wiring connected to the Zuni rocket pod, past where the safety pin should have been and into the firing system. There was a flash and a rocket ignited. The time was 10.51am and 21 seconds. In a split second before anyone could react, the rocket accelerated to hundreds of miles an hour and shot across the deck. It ploughed into at least one and possibly two of the Skyhawks on the opposite side. The impact ruptured a 400 gallon fuel tank attached to Lieutenant Commander John McCain's aircraft, spilling aviation fuel all over the deck as the rocket then shot off the edge of the flight deck, mercifully without exploding. But two seconds later, a rogue bit of hot missile debris landed in the fuel and ignited it, starting a flash fire. The flight deck's plat camera, used for monitoring takeoffs and landings, caught the immediate aftermath, swinging around to see McCain's Skyhawk and those astern of it engulfed in fire and smoke. The flight deck now became a scene of furious urgency. Some pilots scrambled to get out of their aircraft while others stayed put, waiting for the crew to come and put the fire out. It was a long way down to the deck from the cockpit of a Skyhawk without the steps, and one pilot David Dollarhide broke his hip in a fall as he clambered out of his cockpit. Meanwhile, Damage Control Team 8, the specialist firefighters on duty, arrived in seconds, led by Chief Gerald Farrier. Farrier can be seen in the plat footage here, charging towards the fire, clutching a fire extinguisher, closely followed by the rest of his team. As he approached McCain's aircraft, he could see that the rocket had knocked two 1,000-pound bombs onto the deck below, both of which were now engulfed in flame. Farrier set about aiming the extinguisher at the closest of the bombs, knowing that he should have, with modern ordnance, about 10 minutes for his crew to get the fire under control before the bomb cooked off, or detonated, by the fire. On the bridge, Captain Belling could see how serious the situation was becoming and ordered full reverse on the engines, to slow the ship's speed from 27 knots to 9 to stop the wind fanning the flames higher, before sounding general quarters and sending the crew running to their battle stations. Aircraft that had been preparing to take off further forward were directed towards the bow, as far away from the blaze as possible. At the fire, Chief Farrier continued pointing his extinguisher at the bomb near McCain's aircraft, but it was having no effect. Farrier had no idea that he was not dealing with the usual ordnance, but ancient, degraded Composition B explosive that was rapidly approaching its cook-off point. As the bomb began to glow red-hot, Farrier sensed something was wrong and began to wave off the dozens of other crew nearby, urging them to get back away from the fire but in the noise and chaos, it was a futile effort. At 10.52 and 55 seconds, one minute and 34 seconds after the fire began, the bomb exploded. The moment of the explosion was caught by both the Platt camera and a camera positioned on the bow. A huge amount of shrapnel was thrown up in the air as flight deck crews scattered. Farrier and 26 other crewmen were killed instantly, and the damage control team with their specialist firefighting experience virtually wiped out. The fire grew larger, encompassing more aircraft, and then, just as crew were beginning to rush back to help wounded and to resume firefighting, a second 1,000-pound bomb detonated in an even more violent explosion. Shrapnel was thrown the entire length of the ship, and the fire intensified. The flight deck crew now ran for cover, realising the first explosion had not been a fluke and knowing that there were dozens more bombs now consumed by the blaze. Over the next five minutes, there were seven more massive explosions as 1,000 pound bombs cooked off, each one intensifying the fire and punching holes through the armoured flight deck into hangar and crew accommodation areas below, spreading the fire and causing horrific casualties. A plume of black smoke now rose from the forestal, visible miles away in this photo taken from the carrier Ariscony. As the large explosions ended after what seemed like an eternity, a desperate battle against the fire began on the flight deck, as dozens of sailors, many without any firefighting experience at all, grabbed whatever hoses hadn't been shredded and set about tackling the blaze, which by this stage encompassed the whole of the rear of the deck and was creeping its way up the starboard side towards Sky Warrior Tanker 614, which had 28,000 pounds of fuel on board. If the fire reached this aircraft, 
the resultant blaze could be catastrophic for the ship. It was vital to move the Sky Warrior out of the way before this happened, but to do so meant moving several aircraft parked in front of it. As some tried to establish a line of foam to act as a firebreak, dozens of sailors rushed into action to push Skyhawks and a helicopter out of the way so that the tanker could be towed forwards, while firefighting went on around them and there were numerous considerable secondary explosions. Such was the rush to get the Sky Warrior clear of the fire that it actually collides with one of the helicopters as it was moved, dragging it along the flight deck as it was towed forwards. The three vigilante aircraft immediately astern here were not so easily retrieved, with 602 and 603 both damaged by fire before they could be towed out, and 605 stuck in place after a botched attempt to push it over the side, with the crew desperately fighting to stop the fire reaching it. In their inexperience though, some crewmen used both foam and seawater hoses on the same blazes, with the only effect being that water washed away the foam, allowing the fire to breathe, and worse, carried more burning fuel down into the interior of the carrier. On the other side of the deck, Skyhawk 310 was engulfed by fire, but 316 next to it had managed to escape up the deck, but was probably damaged in the blast, maybe leaking fuel, and so was probably the one being shoved over the side in this footage. All three vigilantes also ended up in the sea, with 602 and 603 pushed over the bow, and 605 eventually cajoled over the side by a crane. It then took more than an hour for the blazes on the flight deck to slowly be brought under control, helped by the assistance of the destroyer USS Rupertus, which came alongside and was directing hoses onto areas of the flight deck the Forrestal's crew could not reach. Helicopters too had begun to arrive from the carriers Bonhomme Richard and Oriskany, picking up dozens of Forrestal sailors that had been blown overboard by the explosions and evacuating wounded from Forrestal's overflowing sickbay. It took until 2.45pm, about three hours after the blaze began, for the fires on the flight deck and in the hangar bay to be mostly extinguished. This was far from the end of the story though, as below decks, fires still raged. The flight deck now became a base for firefighting, with new holes cut in it to allow for hoses to be pointed down into compartments that were ablaze. As fires spread underneath the deck, it became incredibly hot in places, with crews having to hoist the hoses up onto their shoulders to prevent them melting. The firefighting was painstaking work, but slowly successful throughout the afternoon and evening of July 29th. As it continued, the captain was now bringing the carrier south, heading for a rendezvous with the hospital ship USS Repose the following morning. The Repose's extensive hospital capacity was badly needed, as the casualties from Forrestwood quickly filled up its own sick bay and that of the two carriers accompanying it. It took until 4am the following morning for the last fires to be extinguished, after an 18-hour fight for the carrier's survival, waged by hundreds of sailors. When the final accounting was taken, the damage to Forrestal from the disaster was extensive. More than $72 million worth, equivalent to $650 million in today's money. 21 aircraft had been lost, with 40 more damaged. The human cost, too, was steep. The disaster had killed 134 sailors. At least 161 others were seriously injured, many with life-changing wounds. And on top of this, but without a quantifiable number, was the toll of PTSD and other mental scars on sailors who had lived through a hellish experience. An investigation into the forestal disaster was headed up by Rear Admiral Forsyth Massey, and after months of work it came to the conclusion that it had been a tragic accident, with no single person accountable for it. Procedural breaches by deck crew in the handling of munitions had combined with an electrical fault to produce the initial fire, which had then been turbocharged by the presence of dangerously unstable ordnance and exacerbated by inexperienced firefighting. The investigation's conclusion did not stop some in the Navy from believing Captain Belling should ultimately be held accountable, and he ended up being marginalised for the rest of his career, sent to finish it by commanding US forces in Iceland. The Forrestal disaster had a huge impact on the US Navy's approach to firefighting. 
New procedures and technology were developed and deployed, like deck edge spray systems that could start suppressing fires almost instantaneously. On top of this, a new firefighting school was set up named for Gerald Farrier. In time, every sailor on board every ship would receive at least some firefighting training. Forrestal returned to service after repairs in 1968 and returned to her traditional deployment in the US Atlantic Fleet. She would never again deploy on combat operations.